All right. Good evening. Welcome to Real Talk, where each Sunday night we feature a mini course or a helpful topic to educate you on real topics, real issues, and offer real solutions. So tonight I am really excited to bring back a return guest by request of our audience. Um, we actually had the first request to have Jay come back while he was presenting. And then I've had multiple requests last then. His last presentation for us actually had, oh, by the time I looked last time, we had over 10,000 views of it. Um, so people really want to know this stuff. Um, so you can read Jay's bio in the feed. But as the president of Homework Solutions, Jay is a deeply respected industry expert on all the ins and outs of the tax and legal issues around pay for those who work in private homes here in the United States. And frankly, this is where my company goes and where we send our students when we have questions, because we always know that we're going to get real answers, real solutions to what's going on. So um, tonight, we're going to talk about being an independent contractor, how and when to claim unemployment benefits, and what amounts, if any, you might qualify for as an independent contractor. We're also going to discuss a little bit about being a small business owner and the loans that you might qualify for. So first, Jay, welcome back. Thanks for joining us again. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Happy to be here. I'll try not to leave any cliffhangers so that uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't have too many requests right away. Fantastic. So last time, you literally had record numbers of views and shares, and we had multiple requests to, to receive you back or have you back here. And we have had this um, announcement about this shared more than anyone that we've ever done. So clearly this is something people really want to know about. Yeah. Um, so what I would like to do before we delve into this is I would like to ask you to give us a really brief definition of what exactly an independent contractor is and is not as it relates to the in-home environment, working sure. and providing care in the home. Sure. So um, I could give you the the stock answer of, well, the IRS has their 20 point test and walk you through the entire list. Right. right. Um, but the, the the simplest way to think of this is who controls the work. Right. Who sets a schedule? Who determines who can be in the home working right? and in the in-home care space? So often that is the family. It's very rare where the the independent contractor is really saying, these are the hours I'm going to be there. This is where we're going to be during that time. Um, yes, they might be saying, here's what I'm doing during that time, but but it's really who controls the work relationship. And so broadly speaking, in household employment, you are an employee. Um, you touched a little bit on uh, those who choose to be an independent business owner, and that's also a, a possibility, right? I, I My personal belief usually is there's an employment relationship. But if you are not moving forward with an employment relationship, you absolutely should be thinking of yourself as an independent business owner and knowing what responsibilities come with that. And there are extra responsibilities. Right. Fantastic. So if, if in hearing this, someone realizes, hey, wait a minute, I think maybe I'm misclassified. Maybe I'm supposed to be an employee or I'm not really sure if I am an independent contractor. What do they do? How do they deal with that? Yeah. So one of the first things I'd encourage you to do is talk to your employer, right? Um, have an open discussion with them about this. I just got a call the other day uh, from an NCS who is scheduled to begin work um, on a job later on this month, actually. And she said, well, wait, now my future employer has come back to me and said, um, they don't want me to be an independent contractor. They want me to be an employee. And they want to change my pay structure as a result of that. And so I spent a lot of time going through this with the, the the NCS and explaining this is doable, right? There is a there is a number, um, an average hourly rate of pay that you can earn as an independent contractor, and know what your take home is from that after taxes, right? You pay your own business taxes, your self employment tax, and everything. Right. Um, there is another number as an employee where your employer is paying some of those taxes on your behalf, right? And your net take-home pay is the same. And so I, I spent a little time with this NCS walking through those two scenarios and trying to say, look, these two numbers, 
whether it's $30 an hour and $24 an hour here, based on the number of hours you're working and the amount of time you're going to spend and the risks you're going to take for which you should be compensated if you're an independent business because you should have uh-huh. insurance and other things, net, net, these two become the same thing. And so you need to think about that and say, if I have been holding myself out as a business and now I think I'm an independent contractor, or sorry, uh, as, as a business and independent contractor, and now I think I'm an employee, one of the very first things you should do is talk to your employer about this because there's a few additional responsibilities that your employer is going to have. There are protections that come with it as well for your employer. By doing everything on the books and calling you an employee and going and getting workers' comp insurance uh, to cover the time that you're working in the home, they are minimizing their own potential risks. Mm -hmm. And so this really can work out to their benefit. And and we spent a lot of time walking uh, NCSs and Tulas and others who have been uh, independent contractors or or classifying themselves that way in the past. We're walking them through that and helping them get prepared for the conversation um, with their employer about, here's the way I think we really should handle this and why. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to go tonight, basically we're going to go with the assumption that the, most of our audience are correctly classified and we really want to focus tonight on independent contractors and small business owners. And a lot of them like those in the nanny industry in the home care industry, and frankly, across our entire country are facing loss of contracts or they're facing reduced hours where in our industry to a degree we can provide virtual support and many people have started doing that kind of thing but it has its limitations certainly Um, but let's assume everybody is correctly classified if they've had less work they've had contracts canceled etc or they're just not booking anybody right now because as you know as a dad there's a lot of value in having a really good oh, quality goodness. caregiver and families hire these people. It's like, hi, honey, I'm pregnant. Uh, hi, NCS. Hi, postpartum doula. Are you available, you know, eight months from now? Cause I need you. Yeah. Um, what are their options under these new acts for unemployment? Um, yeah, let's start with that. Let's start with unemployment. Um, okay. First off, I'll say, obviously this is an unprecedented time, right? I mean, right. We're, we're all dealing with the, the being home and what does this mean for us, but, but it's an unempl- unprecedented time for, uh, the, for governments and the financial relief that they are have to, having to provide in response to this. And so what has happened, the federal government has provided additional funding to the state unemployment systems. We talked a little bit about this uh, a month ago, uh, and they've since expanded it. The, the CARES Act in particular, which was still in the works at that point in time, uh, provided what's called pandemic pandemic unemployment assistance. Mm -hmm. And this really provides a benefit to millions of workers who previously would not have qualified for unemployment benefits. Because as a sole proprietor or an independent contractor, traditionally, you don't qualify for unemployment benefits. You don't pay those taxes when you're running your own business. And so you don't get the benefits from it. Um, But in this case, you do. Uh, in many states, um, in many places, I mean, some employees are going to be making more money uh, when they are not working right now because they're getting unemployment benefits and the additional uh, $600 a week of pandemic unemployment assistance. Mm-hmm. And so there is a period of time through July 25th uh, where there's additional money uh, available to an independent contractor who normally wouldn't qualify, but does now. Not only did they change the amount of money that you're going to qualify for, but um, and not only did they open it up to say you qualify just as an independent contractor if you lost your job, they have changed things to say if you had work scheduled and it has been canceled as a result of COVID-19, well, now you qualify. And so I imagine that for many people in our audience here, they had a job lined up. And, you know, hopefully they had a contract that had everything in place that probably or that that had an, an out in it. Right. For both the employee and employer that said, look, if something falls apart, the employee is still entitled to X amount of pay. Mm-hmm. Um, but even if that happens, the employee is going to suffer some economic harm. Right. It might give them four weeks of pay. But what about the other you know, four weeks that they were supposed to get? Mm-hmm. Well, you have a claim now. Right. Because you had work that was lined up that has been canceled as a result of COVID-19. Therefore, you qualify for this pandemic unemployment assistance. And so there's a very broad list of, of reasons you can qualify that are all related to, pan, uh, to COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So the first thing an employee should do or an independent contractor should do is uh, contact their state department of labor uh, and look at the state unemployment system, right? In most states, it is the department of labor in your state. You go to their website. You can also go to the U.S. Department of Labor website and find your state specific site through there. They, they have a very good website they've built with a lot of frequently asked questions. I believe that they're up to about 92 answers now uh, to questions that are there. Um, so anything that you're thinking of, you should check out the U.S. Department of Labor, get a link straight through to your state website and find out what are the requirements in your state and what's the amount you're going to qualify for. Mm -hmm. Across the board, you're gun going to need uh, pay records of the past uh, at least four quarters. Um, in some states, it's six quarters that you're going to need. Um, in a few states, you can qualify if you've been working just in the past two, but there must be some proof of, of your pay. Right. Uh, that example I gave about somebody who loses a job that's lined up but hasn't started yet, you're going to need documentation of that. Right? You're also going to need work authorization. Right? You must be authorized to work in the U.S., and this is a, a gap in the, the funding. Um, there are many people who do not have work authorization in the U.S., but are actually paying and filing taxes um, who are not getting benefits throughout all this. Um, we won't dive into that too deep because there's really nothing in place for them right now, unfortunately. Uh, but if you've got documentation of your work and your, your work history uh, and the, the fact that you have been impacted by COVID-19, you're going to qualify for a significant benefit. Mm -hmm. So if someone thinks they might qualify, mm -hmm. how do they actually file that claim? Is there like someplace they do it online? Yep. Um, how does that yeah, work? The state website is the way to go. Every state has their own uh, unemployment system, and you are going to file in the state where you were working. So if you're working across state lines, uh, keep that in mind. You are working in the state of Connecticut while living in New York. Uh, your employer was paying into the system in Connecticut, and so that's where you should go file. That's where your work history is. Uh, as an independent contractor, if you obviously uh, were across state lines, you should think about where you're paying your taxes, right? Um, that's where you should file. So go to your state website. Um, they all have a COVID-19 link on them. They've done a very good job of uh, consolidating the information that you need in one place. And I mentioned the documents you're going to need, uh, right? Proof of work authorization, proof of, proof of uh, work and wage history. Mm -hmm. To figure out the amount you're going to qualify for, I can't give a blanket amount. Um, it varies state by state. It varies based upon your work history and your wage history. Mm -hmm. um, but what I can say is that um, it's it's going to vary anywhere from about two hundred dollars a week of unemployment benefits in the the from the low end. I believe that's in Alabama or Mississippi, all the way up to Massachusetts, where it's over five hundred dollars a week in unemployment assistance. And then in all of these states, there's that six hundred dollars a week of pandemic unemployment assistance that is going to be paid on top of the unemployment benefits through uh -huh. the end of June or the end of July. And um, the filing process is, again, fairly easy. Um, I will tell you there are still some delays in the states. Uh, you've all been, if you've been following the news, you've been seeing that there's record numbers of unemployment filings right. each of the past four weeks. This past week, we actually saw it cut in half. It was at 6.6 .6 million people per week filing for unemployment benefits on the first time. This week, it was down to a little over three. Um, and you can expect it might take three weeks to get your first check, but you will be paid for the benefits that you're entitled to all the way back to the time your unemployment started. And this can be backdated. Here's another thing that's different. Um, all the way back to really the start of this crisis, not just when these laws were passed at the end of March, but all the way back to February 2nd. Wow. So if you've been impacted all the way back that far, you really should be going to your state website and filling out the application there. The states are asking, please don't call them. Um, right? They're overwhelmed with phone calls, they're short staffed, and they want to be spending their time processing applications. Right. So many of the people who are in our audience, um, newborn care specialists and postpartum doulas in, in particular, might own a company where they either place other newborn care specialists or postpartum doulas, or they work together as a team. Um, so what about them? If somebody owns a legitimate business where they're like placing other people, is it the same sort of thing or... Do they qualify for something different or how does that work? Yeah, so uh, I'll touch on two points. So if they actually have employees, right, and they need to let those employees go, uh, the employees can qualify for unemployment benefits, right? So good thing to know. Uh, it, it makes that conversation with your employee a little bit easier, makes that 
um, uh, you know, it, it should make you feel good that you've been doing things the right way and um, you don't have to be quite as guilty about it, right? Because this is really the best course of action in many cases for both you and the employee, right? Everybody can stay safe um, and still receive income uh, to meet their needs. For the employer side of it, uh, you might have heard about the Payroll Protection Program, right? That's the the piece of the CARES Act that has gotten the most publicity over the past month. Uh, we've all heard the sensational stories about uh, Shake Shack and Harvard University and uh, right these big uh, and, and hedge funds that are getting big loans uh, as part of the Payroll Protection Program, um, and now many of them giving it back. Uh, well, there's been a second round of funding in the Payroll Protection Program because there wasn't enough for small business owners. And so there's another $310 billion that's been authorized. We're up over uh, $660 billion authorized for this program now. And as a small business owner, the point of this program, and I really want to drive this one home because lots of people are getting caught up in the details of it and trying to understand exactly you know, when the, the periods start and end and how do I get the maximum loan forgiveness. That's important. But the, the point of this program is to keep your staff employed. Right, the payroll protection program is meant to fund the payroll for your employees and the costs of keeping your doors open as a business. Your right. rent or mortgage, if you own the property, um, right, your business's uh, lease, let's say, and your utilities. So the cost of keeping your business open and running and keeping your employees on board. The government is saying, please keep your employee, keep paying them. We don't want them to go on the unemployment system uh, because the unemployment system is already burdened. So the payroll protection program is a loan to you, the employer, that is supposed to be forgivable, right? For the amount of that loan you have used to pay your employees. So if you keep your employees and you keep them working, even if you choose to have them doing something else for your business, Right? They don't have to be doing the same thing they were doing, but if they are still working for your business and you can continue to be productive, you can have them work from home and help you redesign your website right now over the next eight weeks, Right, have them create content, have them do something that's going to position you and your business to be better off in two months when we come out of this, um, keep them employed, keep paying them, and the government is saying, we are going to take that loan and forgive it. Right, the, the government's going to buy it off of your bank where you got it, and so that, that's also a key point. Where you get that loan, you don't go apply with the government. You don't go to the Small Business Association. You go to your bank where you already have a financial relationship, mm -hmm. um, and they are going to be the best one to process this loan. The second round of the payroll protection program. I just saw some stats on it today about uh, how much has been authorized, and it's well over a hundred billion already. I think one hundred and seventeen. Um, you're seeing a big difference between the first round and this round in, in where the money went. It's not going as much to the big banks and to the large size loans. This mm -hmm. one is going to the small businesses um, who really need it right now. All right. So what if somebody applied for a loan already? They had a business, they applied for the loan already, um, and they either didn't get it or um, as a, someone I know, they got a, a notice that basically said, if you haven't gotten a number yet, for this, you should probably consider reapplying at another bank. And then wow. I'm also hearing stories of people who are going to like 10 or 12 or 15 different banks. What do you recommend for people in that situation? Uh, um, I mean, I certainly recommend you go to the bank that you have a, a relationship with already. Um, mm -hmm. Because think about this from the bank side, right? They, they have some requirements of, of knowing who their customer is, right? And these are federal anti-money anti laundering laws. And so it's much easier for them to process a loan with somebody that they already know. So mm -hmm. wherever you have your business banking account, that's where you should go uh, to mm -hmm. apply for this loan. Um, that's it, I'm upset to hear that somebody was effectively told by their bank, you need to go somewhere else uh, because our line's too long. Um, I, I don't know that there's a better solution to them other than contact some of your, your colleagues and your friends and find a new banking relationship. Um, you know, and, and see who had a great experience. And, and if you can find a small bank um, to whom you are kind of a bigger fish in their small pond, that's a place to go. Um, you know, I think that the smaller regional banks are going to have an easier time uh, looking at a loan for a, 
a sole proprietorship under the payroll protection program to fund the payroll for one person and say, yeah, that's worth it to us, mm -hmm. right? Whereas that, not to name names, but you know, the, the Bank of America's and the Wells Fargo's of the world are so big that they're getting hit with millions of these applications. And you know, they were asked to put together a, a program over the course of a week to, to implement it. I, I think that there are some, some challenges that they're still running through. Right, absolutely. Um, so what else do you think is really important that the people who are either independent contractors or have these very small businesses, what other things are really critical that you think they know right now? Um, so there's a few things. I've heard lots of questions from um, small business owners who say, well, my business is seasonal. You know, what am I supposed to do about this payroll protection program and how do I calculate the amount of the loan that I qualify for. Um, so if, if you have a business that is seasonal, um, there has been some clarification provided by the SBA, Small Business Administration, and the Department of Treasury about that. And they're giving you different windows of time from which you can choose the 12-week period that allows you to qualify for the largest loan. Um, so I, I want you to know about that, that, uh, again, the SBA and the Treasury are trying to work with you to, to do the right thing and to find the answers. And they keep updating this program um, as they get questions and feedback about how it's working. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most recent topics I've heard a lot of discussion about is uh, the eight-week period in which your expenses qualify for loan forgiveness. Um, so it's supposed to be eight weeks after the date you receive the funds. Okay. Um, but for many people in many states, they can't bring their employees back to work right now because the state is still shut down. So how are they, are they supposed to pay them to do nothing? Is that what the government's really asking? Um, and so the um, AICPA, right, the, the accounting industry is all reaching out to the Department of Treasury and IRS and others and saying, hey, look, you need to do something about this and potentially change the uh, the that loan forgiveness period so that it's not the eight weeks after you receive the funding, it's the eight weeks after the state reopens and a business can start having their employees come back in. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to be clear, right now the rules still say it's the eight weeks after you receive your funding uh, and the payroll you pay your employee. But um, I highlight this one just as an example of how flexible this still is. And so you really should be keeping an eye on the websites of the Small Business Administration, um, the IRS, the Department of Treasury. Um, if you are a small business owner and you're applying for the Payroll Protection Program loan, if you are an independent contractor who is, or sole proprietorship who's applying for unemployment assistance, um, you should be looking at the U.S. Department of Labor website and you should be looking at your state unemployment website. Again, the, all of these organizations are doing a really good job of, of posting updates uh, on information that is really being thrown at them and they're, they're being asked to implement a program that didn't exist um, within a week. And so you're going to see things continue to change and, and we'll be obviously doing our part to make sure we're passing out updates uh, as often as we can. Right, so we do have um, in the comments, somebody said my bank, also told me that they were not accepting applications anymore and to look elsewhere. Wow. Um, but the specific question said, can you please speak to businesses that run as a sole proprietorship LLC? I've been told I can apply and should apply, but the application is confusing as I do not technically have employees. Yeah, well, you have one employee. As a sole proprietorship, you have one employee, and so that's how you should be filling out the uh, the payroll protection program application. And the amount of the loan that you would qualify for is based off of the compensation that you yourself took uh, over the time period that's laid out in in this uh, in the legislation, which is really from February fifteenth, twenty nineteen, through uh, I believe really it's uh, June thirtieth, twenty nineteen. And again, there's some flexibility there if, if you're a seasonal business. Um, the way you demonstrate your income as a sole proprietorship is that you should be filing your 1040 each year saying, this is my business. It's just me. Here's what I've earned. And you should be claiming that profit or loss of your business on a Schedule C. And so what you're going to need to do with the application process for the payroll protection program loan is file a Schedule C for 2019. 
you do not have to have filed your personal income tax return for the year. Right, that date has been extended until July 15th. However, uh, my understanding is you are still going to be asked, even if it's not complete, um, to give the 2019 Schedule C as you know it today. Mm -hmm. If you haven't filed your 2019 tax return, they're probably going to ask for your 2018 tax return plus what you know about 2019 now. Mm -hmm. So at, at this point in time, most people know that their books on 2019 are closed, uh, right? They filed their tax return because hopefully they're looking for a uh, a little bit of refund from the IRS. Um, and so you probably have that, but be prepared to provide that. Okay. Uh, another question that came up is what is the name of the Q and a section on the department of labor site? I'm looking for it now and I don't see it. Yeah. Um, I actually have it up here in my window. Uh, I would suggest you go to, uh, dol.gov slash coronavirus slash unemployment dash insurance. And you're going to see, um, in fact, if you'd like, I can even share my screen here with you quickly, Tanya. Um, let me do that. Let's see if this will let me. It should. Doesn't look like it is. Not on the lower part of your screen there. Uh, I have to give Zoom permission first, but let's see. Yeah, it's going to make me quit and leave the uh, okay. the meeting. So we won't do that. I'll do that later. But okay. um, go to the Department of Labor website. Um, I'm going to the homepage of DOL right now, actually. And um, when you go there, there's a, a very ugly image of of the coronavirus, right? right. Under the microscope. Um, and there's a button that says Learn More. Right. This is guidance uh, for preparing workplaces for coronavirus. Uh, I take it back. That's preparing when you come back to work. So let's go. Just go to the search bar and you type unemployment insurance. Um, and you are going to find uh, a bunch of the resources that they do have there. Um, they're going to bring them up to you. Okay. Uh, so the person who asked the question about the sole proprietorship said, thank you very much. Yeah. That's what I, all, that was what I thought, but I wanted to be sure. Yep. Uh, we have a question. I'm getting PUA. Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. I worked one week and put the amounts I made in the website, and it said the amount exceeds benefits. So I don't get anything that week, which is fine. Will I still get PUA next week if my income is zero? Yes, you will. So throughout the time that you are receiving benefits or you are impacted by COVID-19, you're impacted by unemployment, right? Um you are supposed to be coming back each week in some states, it's every other week and certifying the income that you made. In normal times, to receive benefits under the unemployment system, uh, you need to be able to demonstrate that you are actively searching for a job. Mm -hmm. Currently, they're waiving that. They're saying, look, we understand in these times, people need to stay home, stay safe, um, and they're gonna have a difficulty finding a job. But you're still gonna have to come in each week or every two weeks and certify any income that you did have, and the state's gonna do a calculation um, every one of those times to say this is the amount of benefits that you qualify for this given period of time. Perfect. Okay. Um, any final tips? I'm going to wait and see if we get any questions, but any sure. final tips for people as they're just trying to navigate this stuff, particularly when they're having a hard time getting answers? Are there any yeah. great sites? Are there any resources? Can they reach out to Homework Solutions? Yeah, um, absolutely. You can reach out to us at Homework Solutions. Um, we're spending way too many hours looking at these websites and uh, yeah. and digging through their details and their frequently asked questions. And so we like to put that to use. Um, all right. I mean, I, I spend most of my time each morning briefing our staff on, hey, here's what I found yesterday. Here's yeah. what just changed. Um, you know, one thing that we talked about last time, Tanya, this might not be a bad time for me to highlight it. Uh, we talked about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and um, the fact that uh, a quarantine order um, or a, a stay-at-home order from the state might not qualify uh, as a reason why you have to stay home. Uh, and that's what all the attorneys were saying. A stay-at-home order is not a quarantine order. Well, thank you, Department of Labor. They have come out and clarified that, yes, it does, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, for their purposes, for FFCRA, that does qualify. So check, the, again, the Department of Labor website, uh, the IRS website on coronavirus. I will tell you that one seems to be the slowest uh, to be updated, uh, but that's because they have the the ultimate burden of dealing with the final answer on how these things are going to be taxed. Right. Uh, and so I think they're being very cautious about how they 
they supply answers. But uh, the Small Business Administration website, also the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, so here's a good one for you. Go to uh, uschamber.com. Um, on their homepage, there's a button to click. Uh, button to click that says "View All Resources uh, About Responding to Coronavirus." So they have the best short little summary I have seen of the payroll protection program. It's five pages. It's got some graphics, but uh, some graphics that, that explain the formula pretty well. Right. right? Some people are visual learners. Some like numbers. Um, I think they did a great job of you know, meshing the two together and mm -hmm. explaining the payroll protection program in, in five pages, not only um, how you apply, what you qualify for, but what potentially is going to be forgiven for you later on. They also built a nice web page with resources for independent contractors. Um, so again, U.S. Chamber has been a good site to check out. Great. And um, Homework Solutions, our knowledge center as well. Um, you know, we keep posting things there. You know, normally, we have a regular schedule of one blog post a week. We're probably putting up three or four things a week right now as, as these are all updated. Right. No, you guys have been doing an amazing job. So we had um, a question that said, my um, bank said I've been approved, um, but I haven't seen any money yet. Does that yeah. mean I'm actually going to still get it? Yes. You're going to get the money. If you've, if you've been approved, that means that they have an approval number from the Small Business Administration, and it might take them a little bit of time. Uh, that After you get the approval from SBA, uh, what is probably going to happen is they're going to send you documents, which is uh, really the loan agreement. Um, it'll be a fairly short thing. Um, you're going to sign it send it back and they probably are going to fund your account that same day or the day after. Okay. Um, they have to, um, by law, uh, this law, uh, fund your account within 10 days. Um, and I believe that's 10 business days. At least that's the way the banks seem to be interpreting it. Mm -hmm. um, so within two weeks, your account will be funded. And this is another place where I would just encourage the business owners on this call to keep in mind um, the, the spirit of this rule and of this program and what they're trying to do to get you to keep paying your employees um, and to incentivize you to do so by telling you we're going to make it forgivable. Mm -hmm. um, and many people, again, are worrying about you know exactly when I make the payment. And they're going to look at that eight-week window and look at all the payments you make to employees in that eight-week window. Make sure that you're paying the amount that you've borrowed right to your employees and to your lease and your utilities in that eight week window in order to maximize the, uh, the loan forgiveness when that comes around. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a couple more questions. Um, Patricia James, if, Patricia, if you're still on and listening, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. So if you could rewrite it, we can ask it and I'll try and get you an answer. Um, because I'm not certain what you're asking yet. Uh, we have another question it says, I saw from a nanny today, if she's uncomfortable working with sick children, COVID or not, and chooses to leave her position, could she apply for unemployment insurance or would the family need to let her go before she qualified? Yeah. So, uh, you know, before this call, I was just looking back through the FAQs again, um, on unemployment assistance. And, um, I saw one specifically there saying that if you choose to leave your job for fear uh, that you might get sick, that is voluntarily leaving. Mm -hmm. um, now, if the employer were to tell you, um, no, uh, I don't want you here because of this, that's them terminating your position. But if you are not going to work just because you fear you may get sick, you're not going to qualify for unemployment assistance unless you have some pre-existing health condition Mm -hmm. And you have a physician who says, you should not go out as a result of this. You okay. should stay home. And I think many physicians are going to tell you if you were to call them and say, and, and many physicians are moving to telemedicine right now. My, my wife and her practice is one. Um, I think that they're going to say, tell me what your situation is. And you're going to say, at my job, three of the people in that home have COVID-19. And a physician is quickly going to tell you, don't go to work. Okay. Now you're going to qualify. Uh, because you have a COVID-19 related reason not to go to work. Okay, great. Uh, so Patricia gave us a, a better explanation. It makes much more sense now um, than what I understood before. And she only added a couple words, but it makes all the difference. Um, I've been home for two months. I have a nanny job and I have an independent contractor job at night. My nanny job is still paying me, but I... Um, 
on those hours since March, uh, I think, oh, she's been paying me on those hours since March. Can I apply to PUA for my independent contractor job, even if my nanny job is still paying me? Yeah, so this is a question really about furloughs, right? Um, well, I, I take it back. It's not. So you had, Patricia, you had two different jobs. Um, and absolutely, you can apply for benefits if one of your jobs disappears or your income at that second job uh, declines. Uh, if there's a reduction in hours, you can apply for benefits. So uh, you absolutely should. Um, the amount of the benefits you're going to qualify for, again, depends upon what your work history is, has been, what your wage history has been. So I can't tell you the exact amount, but it sounds to me like you would qualify. Uh, I touched a second ago on furloughs, and so let me circle back to that. If you just have one job and your hours are reduced, you can still qualify for benefits. Unemployment benefits are not only for those whose job has been fully eliminated. Uh, it is also for those whose work has been reduced as a result of COVID-19. Perfect. So um, we may have other questions that come up afterwards. We find sure. um, that these get shared. Your last one um, was shared over 50 times okay. after the, the live thing. Um, so what we will tell everybody as they're watching this is if you have questions, please tag Jay or tag Newborn Care Solutions so we know that we can get these questions to Jay and try and get answers for you. Um, after this is over. But Jay, I really appreciate you joining us here tonight on Real Talk, sharing your expertise um, and being a continual resource. Homework Solutions has just been an amazing resource to our industry, providing con constant information. And I know that there are so many people that are so appreciative and so are we. Um, so we really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you. We're happy to do it. And uh, I had my dates mixed up last week. This week, I have it correct. So we will not be on next Sunday, May 10th, as that is Mother's Day. I had said this weekend was Mother's Day. Um, but nevertheless, we will not be on next Sunday. So please join us back here live on Sunday, May 17th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern time for more real talk so that we can get you real solutions to the problems that we're facing, the educational needs that we have, um, and to be able to provide an ongoing resource for the in-home industry. So thanks for joining us all tonight. Thank you, Jay, and have a great evening. Thanks, Tanya. Stop.